All right, so today what we're gonna look at is the chapter 22 homework that I assigned through McGraw-Hill for managerial accounting. And what this chapter really focuses on is what we call performance measurement and responsibility accounting. So in this chapter, we're gonna look at things like cost centers, profit centers, investment centers. We're gonna look at controllable versus uncontrollable costs. We're gonna look at how to calculate departmental income, departmental contribution to overhead, residual income, and finally, the cash conversion cycle. And so we'll get to all those items as we move through this homework, and we'll, we'll kind of take them one at a time as they come up. So the way I'm going to look at this question is since we're going to have to be going back and forth between these answers at the top and the questions down at the bottom, I'm just going to take them in order, starting with number one and going through number six. Helps stay a little bit more organized. So the first one says, well, what is a cost center? And you can see the answers, right? So you can see that is telling us that a cost center incurs cost without directly yielding revenues. And that sounds great, but what does that really mean? And so what that means, and, and some basic examples of that, would be things like if you had a manufacturing department for a manufacturer, or if you had service departments, that are things like accounting, advertising, purchasing, right? We typically don't generate the revenue as the accountants. We typically just handle the books. This is obviously different if you have a public accounting firm where the accountants are the ones actually generating the revenue. But in most firms where accountants are just a service type department, they're not going to be directly generating revenue, so they just incur cost. Okay, So they are considered a cost center. Now the next one here is an uncontrollable cost. And it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. And it's costs that are not within a manager's control or influence. And you say, well, why does this matter? Shouldn't we evaluate a manager based on all cost incurred in their department? And the answer is maybe not. Because if I evaluate a manager based on stuff they cannot even control, then I may get rid of a fantastic manager in a situation where nobody could have done any better. And so what I want to make sure is that I'm only recording costs when I'm evaluating my managers that they actually have some influence over. So the opposite then of an uncontrollable cost is what we call a controllable cost. And a controllable cost is going to be one where a manager can significantly influence the amount incurred. And that is a controllable cost. So an uncontrollable cost is just the opposite, which we see in letter F right there. Now the next one tells us, well, what is a responsibility accounting system? Well, an account, a responsibility accounting system is going to be something that provides us with information used to evaluate the performance of a department. And that's really what we'll see as we go through the rest of this video. So I'm not going to dig into it really deep here, but just know that's kind of the direction that we're headed. Now, number four, and it says, well, what are direct expenses? Well, if you've been, you know, keeping along with us all semester, what you should realize, hopefully, is that direct expenses are costs that can be readily traced directly to that individual department. So that is what is called our direct costs, are those things that can be easily traced to one specific department or one specific unit. Okay. Now the next one here says, well, what is a service department? Well, we're down to two, all right? so we know it's either C or D, and in this case it is C. So a service department does not directly manufacture products, but does contribute to the profitability of the entire company. And you say, well, earlier, when you talked about, say, the, the accounting department, you said that that was just a cost center and that they did not actually contribute to profit. And that's kind of what I said, right? What we're saying here is, while the accounting department itself is not generating revenue, the other departments cannot function without the accounting department. Because we can't pay bills, we can't know what we need to order, we can't do any of those procedures if we don't have our accounting department. So that functionality is how these service departments actually are going to be able to influence the profit of the company. And that's exactly what it tells us here in letter C. 
So then number six asks us what an operating department is. And since it's the last one, we know it's going to be D. But let's see if it makes sense. So it tells us that an operating department engages directly in manufacturing or making sales directly to customers. And that's exactly what, what these do. So that sounds good to us. So we're going to move on to number two. Okay. So number two, we're looking at different ways that we can allocate cost. So what we see here is it tells us in each drop down next to the following types of indirect expenses and service department expenses, select the identifying letter of the best allocation basis to use to distribute it to the departments indicated. So in this case, it tells me that we first want to look at computer service expenses of production scheduling for operating departments. Well, in this case, if I'm doing this based on my operating departments and based on production scheduling, then it makes sense to base this on the number of production runs because that is how we're going to deal with the scheduling. Okay, so that is letter A. For the next one, it asks us for general office department expenses of the operating departments. Well, when we look at this one, what we're going to say is, well, what makes the most sense? Does it make sense to base that on the relative number of lights, the number of employees, or the number of machines? Well, in this case, out of those three options, we can tell that it's pretty clearly, hopefully, letter C, because it wouldn't make sense to base the general office department expenses on the number of machines when those are primarily done by people. Okay. So the next one here says, well, let's look at electric utility expenses of all departments. Well, now that we're looking at electricity, out of these options, letter B looks pretty good. We're basing it on the relative number of lights. And the relative number of lights, as that increases, what you would expect then is that electric bill or that utility bill to increase as well. And so that's going to be letter B. And for the last one, it tells us we want to look at maintenance department expenses of the operating departments. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to say we're looking at maintenance expenses for the operating departments. Well, if I'm doing maintenance and I only have one machine, I may not have to do that much maintenance. However, if I have a thousand machines, there's a better possibility that I'm going to end up having to do a significant amount of maintenance relative to that that was required when I only had one machine. So what that tells me then is that it does make sense to allocate this based on the proportion of the number of machines. Because if one department has you know, a thousand machines and another department only has one machine, it might not make sense to split that 50-50. So we'd want to probably allocate this in a more productive manner. And what you might use there is something like the proportion of the number of machines. And so that wraps up number two for us. So now we're going to move on to number three. And what we're going to look at on number three is a responsibility accounting report. So what we're going to see here primarily is, well, how did we do and how is our budget? Right? And so that's, that's really what we're going to look at here. So the first thing we're looking at is what are called controllable costs. So these are things that fall within the purview of the actual manager. So what we see is that I will look up here under my budget and then under my actual, so that whenever I come in in this raw materials section, I'll say, well, what was my raw materials budgeted at for um, for my, my snowmobile department? So I'll come to budget, I'll go to my snowmobile column for budget and actual, and I'll compare the numbers that I find in each location. And so what we'll do is I'll look and I'll find my 21,520 right there. Oops. My 21,520, my 21,420, and then those numbers will just drop right in like so. So not too bad. Okay. So then for the next line, we do the same thing for employee wages. So I say, well, here's my budget, 12,400 in employee wages, and here's my actual, 12,860. And so we'll just go down the line. Right? And you'll notice we actually want these to be in brackets, which is typically not the case. Typically, we use brackets to show subtraction or to show a negative impact in accounting. But in this case, what they're telling us is that if it's in brackets, it means we came under budget. And we want to be under budget with our expenses. 
So it looks like we did pretty good on raw materials. We negotiated some good prices, whatever the case, but we came in actually a little bit under budget. For employee wages, it looks like we paid a little bit more to our employees. And while that may not be good at first, what it could mean is that we actually hired higher quality employees this period. And so maybe the products are better. So yes, I paid you more, but now I'm going to have less come back due to defects or due to other issues that we may have had if we went with a lower quality worker. However, that's not what that definitely means. This could also mean our workers are very inefficient, which could be a result of going with a lower quality worker. So you can't tell just yet, but, but we'll look in another chapter, specifically in chapter 21, exactly how we deal with these variances and how we can break them down and see exactly what is really driving the cause of these variances. So then the next line here is dealing with supplies. So we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to come up here. I'm going to look at my supplies used. 5,500 was my budget and we only used 5,170. So it looks like we came in a little under budget, which is a good thing. Now for depreciation, depreciation is typically fixed. And if it's fixed, then it makes sense that there's no change in what we expected and what we actually incurred. So in this case, there's no difference in that depreciation. And so then we can see exactly what the total costs were associated to these departments by allocating just these, these costs that are actually controllable. So don't forget, that's what we're really looking at here, is that we are looking at the controllable costs. And that's why we're not looking at things like utilities and rent, because these may not be directly controllable by the manager themselves or the departmental manager. So overall, looks like we came in just a tad over budget. Not too bad, but just a little bit over. Okay. <clears throat> so now in the next question, we're going to look at what do we do with those indirect payroll expenses. So in this case, it tells us Jessica Porter works in both the jewelry department, so she works in the jewelry department, and the cosmetics department of a local retail store. She assists customers in both departments and arranges and stocks merchandise in both departments. So this sounds like to me she works in two departments and we're gonna to need to allocate her wages between both departments. So let's see what the question tells us to do. The store then allocates her $29,800 in annual wages between the two departments, okay? Based on the time worked in the two departments. So based on the time worked in the two departments in each two week pay period. On average, Jessica reports the following hours and activities spent in the two departments. So we see selling in the jewelry deport department is 44 hours. Arranging and stocking merchandise in the jewelry department is 10 hours. So this is gonna be our jewelry. So if I take my 44 and my 10, I'll get 54 hours. And then if I come down and I look and I see selling in cosmetics department, 16. And I see arranging and stocking merchandise in the cosmetics department, 11. So now I'm going to draw a line here and that's going to be 27. Idle time spent waiting for a customer to enter one of the departments. We're not going to actually use that amount of time in this calculation. There's no way to allocate it between the two departments. So if I take my 54, my 27, I get 81 hours in total. So you'll see this 81 then comes over and becomes my denominator for my percentage of hours worked calculation. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this 54 straight in here, drop this 27 right there, and that will be my numerator for each of these two percentages. So for jewelry, I'll take my 54 hours spent in jewelry, divide it by my 81 total hours, and I'll see that two thirds of her time is spent in the jewelry department in this pay period. And then I'll see that for cosmetics, only 27 out of 81 hours were spent in cosmetics. So that is one third of her time, and we see that we have properly allocated all 100% of her time. Next, what we want to look at is, well, how do we get the actual allocation? Well, at this point, it's pretty simple. We've done the hard work of getting these percentages. Now we just have to multiply this by the actual amount of wages. So now we'll take this by 
my annual salary of 29800 and we can see that over the year, this is the allocation that we expect, $19,867 to the jewelry department and $9,933 to the cosmetics department. And that's all that we have so far. Okay, so not, not too, too terrible, hopefully. And with that, we'll move on to number five. Now, number five looks like there's a lot of stuff going on here. So we're going to walk through it kind of slowly, but it's really not too bad. We just have to be careful when we do this question to not get overwhelmed by the sheer quantity of information that's thrown at us. But if we take it one piece at a time, I think we'll see that this really is not as as horrible as it looks like at first glance. So let's just read through this real quick. It tells us Marathon Running Shop has two service departments, advertising and administrative, and two operating departments, shoes and clothing. The table that follows shows the direct expenses incurred and square footage occupied by all four departments as well as total sales for the two operating departments for the year 2019. Then it goes on to tell us the advertising department developed and distributed 120 advertisements during the year. Of those, 12 promoted shoes, 108 dealt with clothing. Utilities expenses of $71,000 is an indirect expense to all departments. Okay, so we're going to have to allocate that across all four departments. Now it tells us we want to complete a departmental expense allocation spreadsheet for Marathon Running Shop. The spreadsheet should assign one direct expenses to each of the four departments, the $71,000 of utilities to the four departments, but on the basis of floor space occupied, the advertising department's expense to the two operating departments on the basis of the number of ads placed that promoted the department's products, and the administrative department's expenses to the two operating departments based on the amount of sales. So, there's a lot that we've got to do here. But luckily, they provided us these nice tables that are going to help us do this pretty straightforward in a, in a pretty straightforward fashion. So if we look at this, the first thing we're going to do is allocate our utilities. So we see that in the, each department are listed advertising, administrative, shoes, and clothing. Right, And so those just come straight out of this table right here. Now, to allocate utilities, we were told that they wanted us to allocate these utilities on the basis of the space occupied. So on the basis of floor space occupied. Okay. So what I need to do is look up here and see if I can figure out how many square feet were used for each department. And in this table right here, sure enough, they tell me the square footage used for each department. So I can see for advertising, I have 900 square feet. For administrative, I have 500. For shoes, I have 3,400. And for clothing, I have 5,200 square feet. Now, if you sum all of these up, what you come out to is a total of 10,000 square feet. So we have a nice round number for our total floor space. So each one of these amounts then just slides over and becomes the numerator in our fraction you'll then see this total square footage becomes the denominator in all four departments because we've got the same total square footage dealing with this one joint expense of utilities. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our 900 divided by 10,000, 500 divided by 10,000, 3,400 divided by 10,000, and 5,200 divided by 10,000. That'll give me my percentage of total square footage that is occupied by each department. So now that I have this percentage, I can then multiply that all the way down by the total cost to be allocated. And if you remember, the total cost to be allocated is right here, and it's that $71,000. So once we've gone through and done that, we have now calculated all four of these numbers. So 9% of $71,000 is $6,390, 5% of $71,000 is your $3,550, and so forth. Now, to allocate the advertising expenses, what did they tell us? They said they want us to allocate these ads, or these advertising expenses, between the two departments 
on the basis of number of ads placed that promoted a department's products. So, what we are also told, though, is that 12 ads promoted shoes and 108 ads promoted clothing. So that is where my 12 and my 108 comes from. Just this right here where we're told exactly how many of each type of ad were placed during the year. So that gives me my numerator then for each one of these. Then my denominator is just the sum. So if I take 12 ads for shoes plus my 108, I come out to my 120. Or you could just see that they actually told us it was 120 total ads. However you want to do it is fine. I do recommend, though, just taking that quick second and making sure what you have plugged in comes back to however many total ads they told you about. Because if you're not careful, you could get a typo in here and you'll mess up the whole section. So don't do that. All right, Take the time. Go ahead and work it back out. Make sure you come out to whatever you're supposed to and you know you've got that portion of the question correct. So this 120 then slides over, becomes my denominator for both of those. And now I take my 12 ads for shoes divided by my 120 total ads. My 108 ads for clothing divide that by my 120 total ads. And I see that I've got 10% of my ads going to shoes and 90% of my ads going to clothing. Then I'll take that 10% times the amount to be allocated in advertising of my 22,390, and that will come out to 2239 in shoes and 20,151 in clothing. Okay. Now, for the next section that we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at the administrative section. So for the administrative section, what I've gotta do is figure out how I'm going to allocate this. And what we were told is that we want to allocate these based on the amount of sales. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go up to my table and I'm gonna see my sales numbers for each department. So for shoes, I can see very clearly, I have $139,200 in sales for shoes and $100,800 in sales for clothing. Now if I take the sum of those two items, I'll get $240,000. Now that $240,000, just like it has been, is just going to slide over and become my denominator. And then my 139,200 and my 100,800 just slide over and become my numerator. So now what I'll do is I'll take my 139,200, divide that by my 240, and I'll get 58%. Then I'll take 100,800, divide that by 240, and I'll come out to 42%. Now, we know that there are $32,550 in these costs to be allocated. So we'll multiply by that and we'll come out to both of these numbers here. So hopefully not too bad so far. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna come down here and we're going to look at our departmental expense allocation spreadsheet. So for direct expenses for advertising, I see that there is $16,000, $29,000 in administrative costs, and $110,000 in shoes, and $14,000 in clothing. And if you're wondering where these numbers come from, they come from this column right here, this direct expense column, and it just drops straight in. $16,000 for advertising, $29,000 for administrative, one ten dollars for shoes, and $14,000 for clothing. Now for the indirect expenses, for the indirect utilities expense, what you'll notice is that this total right here comes back to the $71,000 that we had to allocate initially. And that makes sense. So what we're gonna see is that we've actually done the work on this already, and we're just going to pull the numbers that we calculated right here down into this section. So 6390 for advertising goes right there, 3550 for administrative, and so on down the line. Now, that will then give us our total departmental expense if you were to take the sum of each one of these items. So 14 plus 36, 110 plus 24, 29 plus the 35, and the 16 plus the 63. Now, for the advertising department, if we looked, right, we only allocated advertising across two departments, shoes and clothing. So 
there is only a number located in the shoe and department, I'm sorry, in the shoe and clothing department columns. Finally, for the administrative department, the same is true, and we only allocated those costs across shoes and clothing. So once again, those are in the same position as well. Okay. So that is all we've got for number five so far, but we've got one piece left, and that's going to flow through to this next page. And what this next piece is, is really just a separate explanation for how to get to these numbers. So if you didn't like the way I explained it, that's okay. The textbook actually provides a great explanation for how all these numbers get, ca get calculated down here. So if you didn't like something I did, it didn't make sense to you, take a second and review this section. Even if you did, it may make sense to just read through this and make sure you can see exactly how all this came about once again, because this is a lot of moving pieces, but hopefully if you take your time on it and you stay organized, this is not something you cannot figure out. Okay, so just stay confident, stay confident, and you will be fine. So for number six, <clears throat> what we're going to look at is departmental income statements and contributions to overhead. So what we're going to do first is the departmental income statement. So when we do this departmental income statement, what we're really going to look at is sales minus cost of goods sold, and that's going to give us something that we call gross profit. And you see that right there, but I'm going to go ahead and write it down just to draw your attention to it. So sales minus cost of goods sold is going to give us gross profit. Now, you say, well, that's great, but that's not the end of the story, and you're right. So then we have to back out what are called our operating expenses. Those operating expenses include things like salaries, utilities, depreciation, and office expenses. And you say, well, what's going on right here with these indirect amounts? Do we care about that? And the answer is that we absolutely do care about that. We just don't care about it yet. Okay, so for this part right now, we're not going to use this indirect information. That'll come on requirements two and three. But for requirement one, we just need the full amounts. So we've got our gross profit of 195. We then back out my salaries of 111, utilities of 16, depreciation of 44, and office expenses of 29,400. So when we come down to the bottom line, what we see is that we have an operating loss of almost $6,000. So the question we're trying to answer here is, would it make sense for us to, to eliminate this ski department from the company structure. And if you were to just look at the operating loss, your, your gut instinct might tell you, yes, that department is losing you money. You need to get rid of it. For the health of the company, we need to get rid of non-profitable segments. And you might be right. But you might not be. And that's what we're about to see here in requirement number two. So if we scroll down to requirement number two, what we're going to look at is contribution to overhead. So is any contribution to overhead being made? And if there is a positive contribution to overhead, then the company would actually be worse off by eliminating this non-profitable department. So in number two, what we do is we're going to look at what is called a departmental contribution to overhead report. This is different than the departmental income statement that we looked at in the prior question. So keep that straight. Understand the difference in the two reports. So what we're going to do here is it starts off very similarly to the last report. We begin with sales. We back out cost of goods sold. And that gives us gross profit of 195 And if you scroll up, sure enough, this is the exact same gross profit we had earlier. Now... Where does the change come in? Well, the change comes in because now instead of looking at operating expenses, we are looking at direct expenses. You say, well, well, why do we only care about the direct expenses? Well, that's a great question. And the, and the reason here is because if I were to eliminate this department, I can get rid of the direct expenses, but those indirect expenses, those are just going to be reallocated to another department. So overall, I can't get rid of those indirect expenses right now. So when I'm looking to determine if I should keep this department or not, it doesn't make sense to hold them entirely responsible 
for these indirect costs that they may or may not have any kind of control over. So, how do we get the numbers that we see here? Well, this is where we come in and we need to deal with the numbers in these parentheses. So, if I take 111,000, I reduce that by 25,200, what I'll come down to is $85,800 in direct salaries expense. And the reason you know that's direct is because it tells us the total is $111,000 and $25,000 is indirect. So if I take total expenses minus indirect expenses, what I get is my direct expenses. Now this can also be rewritten to show the addition. So you could say, well, direct expenses plus indirect expenses equal total expenses. So however you need it is fine, but in this case, this right here will work. So that's all we've got to deal with there. Okay. So I'm just gonna clear this out. Just get us that space back. And then we'll move on to the next piece. So then how did we get this 10,500? Well, it's the same way we got our 85,800. And it's simply by taking this 16,400 less your 5,900 in indirect. And that gives you 10,500 in direct costs related to the utilities of this department. And finally, the same thing is done with depreciation. Now, since office expenses are all indirect, they have not been included in this table. Although, I guess, in real life, you could get away with putting that there and just calling it a zero. Typically, you won't do that because we typically don't include zeros on accounting reports. So the homework will, I believe, count it wrong if you do include that zero for the office expenses. So don't do that, leave it blank since there's nothing that actually needs to go there and we'll just move on to the next piece. So what you see then is that we actually end up with a contribution to cover overhead of $72,400. You say, well, what does that really mean? Well, that means that if I get rid of this department because I looked at it and I said, you're losing me money, you've gotta go. Well, what I just did is I threw out $72,000 that were helping me cover these indirect costs. Now that this department is no longer generating this contribution to overhead, the other departments now have to generate an extra $72,000 just to make up the ground that is lost by eliminating this non-profitable department. So be very careful when you're looking at eliminating a department to determine how much of that can actually be eliminated if we get rid of that department. And that's what we see here, is that you're actually better off keeping this department. And that's what number three tells us, is that based on these performance reports, the ski department should not be eliminated because it generates a positive contribution to overhead. Now, if when we did this math, say the numbers came out and this ended up being minus $2,000 for your contribution to overhead, at that point, then it would make sense financially to remove this department because it is actually losing us money. Right? It's actually a detriment to the organization. But right now, it's actually still helping us even though it looks, at first glance, like we might should eliminate it because we've got an operating loss. So just be very careful when you're making those kinds of decisions. Make sure you really think them through all the way. Now for the next question here, what we're doing is we're going to look at how we calculate return on investment. So here, what we've got to do is we're going to look at the way that we actually handle this. So for our investment center, what we see is that my operating income is $365. So for beverage, I'm just going to drop that 365 right there. 
For cheese, I'm just gonna drop the $650 right there. So now, for the denominator on return on investment, I need average invested assets. So for average invested assets, for my beverage department, what I'll do is I will take my invested assets at the beginning of the period, plus my invested assets at the end of the period, and I'll divide those by two. So let's just jot down what we're doing here. So to calculate ROI, I'm taking operating income, divided by average invested assets. which can then be rewritten as ROI equal to, I'm going to abbreviate operating income as OI, divided by beginning, I'm just going to say beginning assets, this is really beginning invested assets, All right? so just know that, but beginning assets plus ending assets divided by 2. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So if I were to take my $26.95, my $26.09, add those together, divide by 2, what I would come out to is this 2652 And then I'll do the same exact thing for my cheese division. And I'll add up my 4488 my 4416 divide those by 2, and I'll come out to this 4452 So now the question is, well, what's ROI? Well, now that we've done the hard part of getting this average on the bottom, now it's just a matter of division. So 365 divided by 2652 gives you 13.76. And 650 divided by 4452 will give you 14.6%. So now we've calculated our return on investment. Now it's time to look at profit margin. So for profit margin, what we're going to do is I'm going to take my operating income divided by my sales. So in this case... I'm no longer looking at my average invested assets because for profit margin, oops, for profit margin, the formula we care about is operating income divided by sales. So in this case, my operating income stays the same, my 365 and my 650 that we just saw in the last question. But now my denominator changes. And in this case, it is $26.97 for my beverage department and $39.41 for my cheese department. So now that we've plugged in those, we just do some simple division of 365 divided by $26.97, and we get 13.53%. And we take 650 divided by $39.41, and we get 16.49%. So now that we've computed that, we can move on to the next section. Now, I do want to make one quick point before we do move on to, to the third part of this and, and see if we can figure out what's going on here. So in this question, when we calculated return on investment, on the bottom, we used an average. So we used average invested assets. But here, we didn't need average sales for profit margin. You say, well, why is that? I'll tell you the general rule. Now, there are some exceptions to this rule, but for the most part, this is the way this is going to work. So if you are comparing an income statement item, which deals with only one period of time, and a balance sheet item, which deals with multiple periods, then what you've got to do is you've got to take an average of that balance sheet number to bring it in closer to be more comparative to that single period number of that income statement item. An operating income is an income statement item. An average invested assets is the combination of two periods of asset numbers, or I'm sorry, of the beginning and ending asset numbers for something found on the balance sheet. So we do want to make that comparison. But here in profit margin, operating income and sales, they're both on the income statement. So there's no reason to make any kind of adjustment here. So we can just take straight division. Now, certain formulas are going to twist that just a little bit, so it's not a perfect rule, but that's the general rule, is if you're comparing income statement and balance sheet items, you typically have to take an average of that balance sheet item. Okay. So now for number three, we're going to compute 
investment turnover for the year. I'm going to abbreviate this as ITO, so investment turnover. And that is going to be equal to my sales, oops, my sales divided by my average invested assets. So in this case, I'm just going to come back up here. I'm going to look at my sales, my 2697, my 3941. There they are. I'm going to pull down those average invested asset numbers from when we calculated our return on investment. So if you want, we can just flip back up to that real quick and you can see, sure enough, there is my 2652 for average invested assets and my 4452 for average invested assets for the other department. So definitely, those just pull straight down through. And we actually see an investment turnover here for the beverage department of 1.02 and an investment turnover for the cheese department of only 0.89. So in this case, we actually do see the higher investment turnover with the beverage department, which is dissimilar to what we've seen up to this point where the cheese department has been outperforming the beverage department. So now that we're done with number seven, we can move on to number eight. So for number eight, what we're gonna do is we are going to calculate residual income. So the way that we calculate residual income, so if we look, the way we calculate our residual income is just equal to actual income minus target income. So in this case, what we see is that my target income can be calculated by taking my average assets times my targeted return on assets. So that's exactly what they do here, is they say, well, my average assets were $2,652, and for my cheese department, my average assets were $4,452. We had a targeted return of 8% on our assets. So our ROA was 8% that we wanted. So if I achieved that, then what I should have had was a minimum of $212 in target income for my beverage department and $356 of target income for my cheese department. So now we say, well, what did we actually have? And these are the same numbers from the prior question. So that 365 and the 650 still pull back through. And then we're gonna back out this 212 and this 356 and it'll come down and give us what our residual income actually turns out to be. And that's all that there is to this one. So hopefully not, not too, too terrible. Some, some formulas we haven't seen before, but hopefully now that we've talked about it, they make a little bit of sense. So the only one I didn't write down so far is that the formula for target income equals targeted return times your average assets. Okay. And so now we will move on to number nine. So for number nine, we're once again dealing with profit margin. So we're told here that Apple Inc. reports the following for three of its geographic segments for a recent year. So it tells us that in the Americas, in Europe, and in China, these are the operating results. So operating income was $30,684,000. In Europe, it was $16,514,000. In China, it was $17,032,000. And likewise, we can see sales for each area. So if you remember how we did this earlier, what we said was that for profit margin, we take operating income divided by sales. So all this is is just a matter of plugging in these numbers. So I'll do the first one for Americas, but I'm not going to bore you to death and do the other two as well. So for the Americas, we just take my 30 million, or my 30,000, I'm sorry, 684, divided by 96,000, 
600. And those numbers just come from right there. And when you do that, it will come out to 31.8% for your profit margin. So hopefully that one makes some sense. And then you'll just repeat that process for both Europe and China. So that's all there is to number nine. It's kind of nice to have this one here toward the end. It's a little bit of a breather after some of the longer ones that we've been working through up until this point. So now we'll move on to number 10. So for number 10, what we're looking at here is what is called a balanced scorecard. So the balanced scorecard says is basically, it doesn't always make sense to only look at a company's financial performance. Because if I only look at a company's financial performance, then I may be ignoring some other aspects that we typically consider important as society when we evaluate how a company is actually doing. So what we do with the balanced scorecard is we realize that the balanced scorecard is basically broken into four pieces. So the first of these is what is called the customer orientation. And this says, well, what do customers think? And, and specifically, what do they think about us? Do they like us? Do they not like us? Do they think we're ethical? Do they think maybe we're not so ethical? What is the perception that our customer base has of us? Do we give high quality products, but are we high priced? Do we meet somewhere in the middle? Are we very cheap, but we're low quality? All those types of things come in to the customer viewpoint. That's things like customer satisfaction, the number of new customers we've acquired, how often do we deliver on time to our customers? How often are customers buying new products? How long does it take us to ship and fill an order? How many of those sales come back because this customer was dissatisfied, changed their mind, found a better price, whatever the case is. And right, so we want to make sure that we're always looking at this customer orientation. It's very important. The next one that we need to look at is what is called the internal process orientation and this says really what is crucial so what has to be here to meet our customers needs and so what we're going to say here is this is things like maybe we want a very low percentage of defective products we want a very quick cycle time so beginning to end on that product we want that to be as fast as possible with the highest possible quality we want to control our, our product costs. We want to maintain a specific amount of time put into each order so that we're not ballooning costs somewhere. So we want to make sure we're able to manage all of these different types of items. The next tier is what we call innovation and learning. So for innovation and learning, the question we ask is how can we improve and you always can right there's always going to be room for improvement so we want to make sure that we're not getting complacent if you feel like you're at the best possible area the best possible situation that is great but we want to continue pushing and looking for new alternatives looking for new methods because at one point in time right a typewriter might have been the absolute peak of of technological innovation when it came to recording notes and it came to doing other things, but then a computer with a screen came around, you could actually backspace and make changes. So if you were stuck on this typewriter method, that would be fine. You could still get the job done, but it would take a lot longer and it would be a lot more burdensome than once you switch to this computer where you can actually make edits. And then beyond that, we've now moved on to laptops and iPads and all kinds of other technology that, that allows us to communicate information effectively and efficiently, but only because someone took the lead and drove forward on this uh, on this innovation and forced us into learning kind of what we needed and we didn't even realize what we wanted as the consumer until it was created. And so it's having that always looking at it from that from that perspective. And finally the last one here is financial. Right? If we're gonna evaluate you in a business, we do have to look at the numbers. So this says, what do our owners think? So are our owners happy? And you think, well, well who owns a company? Well, 
The answer really is whoever owns the shares. So if you own shares in the company, you own that company. Now, if you only own one share of Walmart, do you technically own a piece of Walmart? Absolutely, you do. But there are so many shares in Walmart that your ownership is so diluted that while you do have some ownership, you probably don't really have any actual influence. But if you own, you know, 30% of Walmart, well, now you might actually have the ability to make some changes to influence some policy at that organization. And so we're going to really be more concerned with the people who own a significant amount because it's just easier to, to talk to one person and say, well, hey, how do you think we're doing versus trying to call up millions of separate shareholders? So that's really what the financial picture looks at is how do our owners view us? Do they think we're being good stewards of their resources or do they think we're not being good stewards of their resources? Okay. So now we're going to go through some examples. And in this case, we got 14 examples. And what we're going to do is we're just going to talk through each one and see if we can figure out how they all actually work. So in this case, what we'll see is how each one of these comes about. So on number one, it asks us, well, what would be the most logical reason for looking at on-time flight percentage? And you might say financial, and I could see that, right? You could say, well, financial, because if we have a lot of delayed flights, we might have fewer flights, which could you know, reduce the profitability of the organization. It could lead to all these things, and that's all true. But the reason this is customer is because as a customer, am I going to lose you if I'm consistently having late flights? Probably so. If I know every time I've ever scheduled a flight with your company, the flight is six hours later than it was supposed to be, I'm probably not going to schedule a flight with your company very often. This is going to lead to a very dissatisfied customer's, customer base, and so this is going to heavily be influenced by that customer performance mesh, by that customer performance measure. Okay, so the next one, net income, is probably the easiest one on here, right? Net income is definitely going to be a financial metric because it is coming straight off of our income statements. So it's definitely a financial metric. Now, the next one here, employee diversity training sessions are completed. This is going to be our internal processes. So this is going to say, well, what do we need to make sure that the environment in the company is healthy, that our employees feel they're able to communicate with one another and get work done effectively? So that's going to handle that internal processes. Now for the next one, airplane miles of gallon, or I'm sorry, miles per gallon of fuel. Oops. I am so sorry. I got confused when I was talking about employee diversity. And I saw the I, and apparently I thought that meant um, internal process. That is not what that means. So I'm going to make me a key real quick so that doesn't happen again. So for customer, we're going to use C. For internal processes, we're actually using P. For innovation and learning, we're going to use I. And for financial, we're going to use F. So the actual answer here, and I am so sorry about this. Um, I just got confused and tried to, to make that that makes sense to me and to y'all, but the actual truth here is that this employee diversity training session is really going to be dealing with this innovation and learning. So this is saying maybe this is something new to the company, or maybe we haven't done this in the past, but we do think this is going to help the company operate in a more smooth manner because we're going to be able to improve communication between employees and improve the environment for all of our, for all of our faculty. So that is actually going to be this innovation and learning for, for number three. Now for the airplane miles per gallon of fuel, this is an internal process because if I'm an air flight company, right? If I am an airline, what I want is to maximize the number of miles per gallon of fuel. And the way we do that, right? Might be by limiting flight size or doing other things. But the question here is at what point does it make sense to increase that miles per gallon of fuel maybe by you know only flying half flights, but now half our seats are empty. And so we're foregoing all this revenue. So we've got to try to find some kind of balance here where we can deal with this, but that is going to be our internal processes. 
Now for number of reports of mishandled or lost baggage, that's gonna be the customer orientation. All right, we don't wanna be losing our customers' goods because that will leave them with a very dissatisfied view of our organization. Cash flow from operations, that is also gonna be a financial metric just like net income. And you can typically find this, of course, on your statement of cash flows. Now for the percentage of ground crew trained, this is going to be an innovation and learning thing because we're saying, well, how can we improve? Well, if I am trying to improve, it might make sense to take the time and really train up my employees properly. And so that is going to be that innovation and learning piece. Accidents or safety incidents per mile flown, that's going to be pretty crucial, I would say, to the operation of an airline industry or an airline company because if my planes are consistently falling out of the sky and crashing or having some other technical malfunction, then I'm not going to make it very long as an airline. So I want to make sure that I'm able to maintain that to an acceptable level of hopefully very, very close to zero. Now, the next piece here says that we want percentage of on-time departures. That is once again coming back to that customer focus. We're trying to keep the customer satisfied by doing what we were expected to do, which is leave that flight on time. Now, for the revenue per passenger, what we're going to look at here is revenue per passenger is definitely another financial metric. It's dealing with revenue. Revenue is on the income statement. Very direct correlation right there. Now, for the next one, flight attendant training sessions attended. Well, this is once again going to be innovation and learning. So pretty much any time we see the phrase training, we're going to assume this is a kind of a key word for this innovation and learning that we're talking about here. Now, the time the airplane is on the ground between flights, that is going to deal with this internal process. Ideally, if I'm an airline company, I want that plane to land, to disembark the passengers, to get their luggage off, whatever the case is, taxi it around, fill it up with gas or with diesel, jet fuel, you know, whatever we're, whatever planes use. But then we want to come in and actually run over that plane real quick, make sure there's no technical issues, talk with the pilot, make sure everything went fine, and then we want that plane back up in the air as soon as possible so that we can get in as many flights as possible, which one, helps us from a financial perspective, but two, it helps our customers because it provides more availability to those customers. The next piece here is customer survey ratings. Well, of course, if the customers are rating us, that is definitely a customer-focused item. And finally, market value. Market value, of course, is also going to be a financial metric. So now that we've worked through these different performance measures, we hopefully have a better understanding of exactly what the balance scorecard is. Now, for number 11, we're going to keep looking at this, but now we're dealing with sustainability in the balance scorecard. So it tells us Midwest Manufacturing uses the balance scorecard as part of its performance evaluation. The company wants to include information on its sustainability efforts in its balance scorecard. For each of the sustainability items below, indicate the most likely balance scorecard perspective. So customer is going to be C, once again. Internal processes will be P. Innovation and learning will be I. And finally, financial metrics will be F. Okay. Now, I'm not going to go through these quite as detailed as I did on the last page because it's very similar material. So hopefully, by looking at what we covered on number 10, you can make sense of these, but I will kind of still walk through them and talk through them just a little bit. So customer rating of sustainability reputation, it's definitely a customer focus, right? We're, we even see the word customer in this question. So we know that's a customer focus. Average price of green products, well, that's gonna be a financial metric because we're gonna make sure that we can actually afford to deal in these green products. Hours of sustainability training. Once again, we see the word training. We typically jump straight to that innovation and learning and once again, that is the, the, the case here. Now for the cubic feet of natural gas used, that is an internal process. Ideally, we wanna keep that as low as we can because we're having to buy that. So every time we need to use it, we want to, but we don't want to use it needlessly. 
Next, customer surveys. Once again, we see the word customer. We see that they're actually evaluating us, and that is, once again, going to pull down through this customer orientation. Dollar sales of green products. Okay, Once again, we're talking about dollars and cents. That's going to tell us that this is a financial metric. For the number of new green products developed, right, if we're developing new products, that's innovation and learning. For the kilowatts of electricity used and the CO2 emissions, both of those are dealing with crucial items to the company's organization success. And so we want to make sure that we're able to monitor those and, and deal with those properly. And finally, the dollar amount spent on researching green products. So here they try to trick you a little bit by including dollar amount because they want you to see that and go straight to it. But the key here is not that, it comes later. And it's that they are researching green products, which tells us once again that this will be innovation and learning. Now for number 12, there's quite a bit of work that we're gonna have to do for number 12. It's not that complex, truthfully, but it is quite long. So what it tells us is that we want to use the information above, so this information right here, to compute the number of days in the cash conversion cycle for each year. So you say, well, that doesn't sound too bad. Well, there's a few calculations we're going to have to do, but hopefully none that we can't, we can't deal with. So what it tells us here is, one, we want to compute that, but then two, we want to answer this question. Did the company manage cash more effectively in the current year? Okay. So let's see. Well, what is the cash conversion cycle? That's probably the best place to start. So let's start there. So cash conversion cycle. This is how long it takes us to go from we've purchased our inventory, uh, typically on account. So we've got some accounts payable outstanding. We bring that back. We put it on our shelf in inventory. How long does that sit there before it gets sold? But then once we've sold it, typically we'll sell on credit. So now from the point of that sale, how long does it take to actually receive the money? So we're going to look at is how long does that sit on my shelf plus how long does it take the customer to pay for it once they bought it? But then we get to reduce this by the amount of time that we left our payables outstanding because that's the time that we kept the cash within the organization. So we'll see exactly how this works. But the way this is going to fall out is as a day's sales in AR. This is accounts receivable. I'm just abbreviating for the sake of space. Plus day's sales in inventory minus days payable outstanding. So this is how many days our payables are actually out there. So now I'm just going to follow down through here and just write out these formulas for us. So I'm going to label these as 1, 2, and 3. So I'll have to rewrite those down here. I'll just label them as 1. And this will be separate. So this is going this way. And this is calculated as accounts receivable. Make sure you use net. So if there's any allowance, you take that out. Divided by net sales times 365. And this is my day sales in AR. Okay. So hopefully you see that and hopefully that makes sense. Now two, so we're going to deal with my day's sales in inventory. This is going to be inventory divided by cost of goods sold times 365. And finally, day's payable outstanding will be my accounts payable divided by cost of goods sold times 365. Now, if we talk about these real quick, do, what do you think? Do you want the cash conversion cycle to be really, really high or really, really low? And in general, what we want is the cash conversion cycle to be low because that means we're quickly getting our stuff 
purchased for us, sold to our customers, and collecting the cash. And that seems like a good scenario. But could we ever be collecting stuff to, or collecting these receivables too quickly? In other words, can my cash conversion cycle actually be too fast? And the answer is also yes. Because what that could mean is, while I may be managing my accounts payable beautifully and paying on the last day available every single time, and I'm never paying early, so I'm able to maintain that cash within my company as long as possible, what is happening is I may be actually either harassing my customers too much and they're paying, but then I'm losing the customer in the future because they're sick of me, or maybe I'm pricing my inventory so low that everybody can afford it. So yes, they're buying it. Yes, I'm turning it over very quickly, but if I'm selling everything at 80% off the normal price, that may have larger ramifications for the organization than the good cash conversion cycle that it will generate. So we want to make sure that we're actually managing this within a certain range. And you say, well, what range is acceptable? And the answer is truly it just depends. It really depends on the organization and what industry they're in. For example, if I'm selling, say I'm Walmart, and say I'm primarily focused on one of those offshoot Walmart stores that's just selling the groceries, the bread, the fruit, the vegetables, just primarily stuff that expires, that goes bad fairly quickly. I would expect a cash conversion cycle for one of those stores to be quite quick, maybe two, three weeks, maybe a month, somewhere in that range, but hopefully very, very rapid turnover of that cash. However, if I build massive yachts, right? They take me four or five years to build them. They're huge. They're very nice. They're very expensive. The cash conversion cycle for something like that is going to be significantly longer than the cash conversion cycle for a company like, say, a Walmart grocery that just sells, you know, items that, that expire very rapidly. So we want to make sure that we're looking within an industry because if I'm building skyscrapers in New York and I'm trying to compare my cash conversion cycle to Walmart down in Texas, that's probably not going to work very well because I'm going to look at that and I'm going to say, oh my gosh, my cash conversion cycle is 50 times longer. Well, it makes sense that it is because what you're doing probably takes significantly longer than it does to sell, you know, bread, eggs, milk, apples, whatever the case is. So, so we want to make sure we're, we're managing our expectations even within that kind of a range. So that's all that we have there. So now that we've kind of discussed this, we're actually going to look at how the numbers work out. So we're going to do this twice. We're going to do this for the current year and for the prior year. And so for the current year, what I've got to do is first calculate my day's sales and accounts receivable. So to do that, I'm going to take my accounts receivable net at the end of the year, this 22645 I'm going to divide that by my net sales of 194000 and I'll multiply that by 365, because that's how many days are in a year. When I do that, I will come out to 43 days. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use red and I'm just going to track below where I've got this one, two, and three. And I'm just going to write down how many days each piece of this is actually adding or subtracting. So for day sales and AR for the current year, we have 43 days. Now for my day's sales in inventory, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my $8,464 in inventory at the end of the year. I'm going to divide that by my cost of goods sold of $103,000. And then I'll multiply that by 365, and I will get 30 days. So right now, I'm at 73 days. That's not very good, I don't think, because if we looked at the prior year, when we get done with this, if we just stopped now, this would be far higher. So we don't want to do that. So we want to continue. We said, well, what else could affect the amount of time it takes to go from me purchasing something through the customer buying it, through selling that to the customer and actually collecting that cash? Well, the only other piece here that we've got to deal with is exactly how long it takes us to pay off these payables on average. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to take my accounts payable balance. So that will be, um, give me just a second to get this erased. 
So I will take my accounts payable balance of $6,163. I will divide that by my cost of goods sold of $103,000. And once again, I'll multiply this by 365. And when I take that, I will get 22 days. Now, when I do 43 days plus 30 days, I get 73. Minus 22 will give me 51 days in my cash conversion cycle. And so was that good or bad? Is this an improvement or is this worse? And the answer is we just don't know yet. Okay, so we're going to have to work back through and redo all these calculations, but for the prior year. So let's do that real quick. So now when I come through, I'm going to look and I'm going to calculate for my prior year. And I'm going to say, well, for my day sales and accounts receivable, I've got to take my accounts receivable net which in this case is going to be 16,794. I'm going to divide that by my net sales of $153,000. And then I'll multiply that by 365. And when I do that, I'll get 40 days. Now I'll add my day sales in inventory. And when I do my day sales in inventory, I'll take my 7,735 in inventory at the end of the year. I will divide that by my cost of goods sold of 123,000 and I'll multiply that by 365 and that will come out to be 23 days. And finally, whenever I come in and I look at my days payable outstanding, what I'll do is I will take my $10,108 that we have in AP or in accounts payable at the end of the year. I will divide that by my cost of goods sold of $123,000, and I'll multiply that by 365. So now that we've done that, that will bring us out to 30 days. So what we can see now is when I take 40 plus 23, I will get 63 days. Then I will back out my 30 days, and this will bring me out to 33 days of cash conversion cycle. For the prior year. So you say, well, it looks like we're done with the question and we're done with part one. You're absolutely right. But there was a second question here that said, did the company manage cash more effectively in the current year? And if we look at this, we're saying, well, this whole process in the current year took me 51 days, but last year it only took me 33 days to work through this process. So what this tells me is no the company did not manage cash more effectively in the current year. That's because it's taking us significantly longer to get through this same process this year than it did last year. So we're now done with number 12, and we can move on to number 13. So for number 13, what we're looking at is what we call transfer pricing. So in this case, it tells me, the trailer division of Baxter Bicycles makes bike trailers that attach to bicycles and can carry children or cargo. The trailers have a retail price of $103 each. Each trailer incurs $42 of variable manufacturing cost, and the trailer division has the capacity for 28,000 trailers per year with fixed costs of $570,000 per year. <coughs> so if we assume the assembly division of Baxter Bicycles wants to buy 4,700 trailers per year from the trailer division. If the trailer division can sell all of the trailers it manufactures to outside customers, what price should be used on transfers between the divisions? Well, if I can sell all of these to people outside of the organization, then if I'm selling within the organization, I should also sell at the same price that I would sell to my customers. So in this case, it tells me that the retail price was $103 each, so in this case, we will sell to the other division also at $103. However, if we assume the trailer division currently only sells 9,700 trailers to outside customers and the assembly division wants to buy 4,700 trailers per year, what is the range of acceptable prices that could be used on transfers between the divisions? So in this case, what we've got to do is say, well, what price would not be acceptable 
to the trailer division? And the answer there is anything less than my variable cost would not be acceptable. So in this case, it tells us, well, each trailer incurs $42 of variable manufacturing costs. And we see that right there. So what that tells me is that I have to at least pay them that $42. And that's exactly what you see here. However, I'm still not going to be willing to pay you more than whatever you would have charged an outside customer. So that gives me the maximum price, which is the retail price of $103. So now a question I could ask you is, in situation two, would a transfer price of, say, $76 be acceptable? And it could be. But would a transfer price of $34 be acceptable? And the answer is no. No, that would not be acceptable because 34 is less than my 42. So it would not be acceptable to the trailer division. So that wraps up the end of the homework for this chapter. So hopefully now you've got a better understanding of exactly how all these, um, how, how all these items work. And hopefully this has helped you. So I'll see you next time.